Hello and welcome to Hamilton the Podcast. I'm Vinton Bain. And I'm Robbie Herlocker. We're about to get into our episode, but before we do, we're joined by two lovely ladies here at the table today, and we are excited to share with you their podcast, Fathoms Deep, which is about the show Black Sails. We want to get you into this podcast because if you like Hamilton the Musical, we think that there are a lot of things about this show that you will enjoy as well. So, Liz, why don't you introduce yourself and tell us a little about your podcast? Sure. I'm Liz Stevens. I am from the Common Room Radio Network. And Black Sails, not a musical, not exactly like Hamilton, but it is full of just tragic heroes and beautiful human stories, which is, I think, what draws so many people to Hamilton the musical. So we'd love to have the crossover of the listenership. I think that there's a lot that people can get out of these two compelling stories. Daphne, do you want to talk a little bit about why you love Black Sails? Well... I love Black Sails because it's some of the best storytelling I've ever seen. And I adore Mm -hmm. Hamilton and I adore Hamilton, the podcast. And I do. I feel like we've got such similarities in such rich storytelling and rich characters. Mm -hmm. And the thing I love most about both of these stories is the ties to history. Ours also is tied to the history of pirates, but also a world where characters are rich enough that they're not just good or bad, that everyone is someone that you can relate to and you can understand when they do the wrong things for the right reasons. Mm. And I find that the most compelling thing in a character. Daphne, you were the one that actually got me into Black Sails because it was a part of the 18th century trifecta of shows <laughs> that we were all loving at the moment because this takes place in the 18th century, much like Hamilton the musical takes place at the beginning of it in the 18th century, and then we also love Outlander. And so mm-hmm. in each of these, you'll get to see some, uh, I mean, there's some red coats and duels, and there are lots of gunfights and sword fights and ships on the high seas, and lots of exciting times happening there. And so the history is exciting, the storytelling is lovely, mm-hmm. and the, the cinematography on that show is beautiful. And I'm grateful to both of you for helping to unpack this show in such an incredible, insightful way, and even inviting me into the series. It's been wonderful. Oh, thank you, Ravi. Liz and Daphne are two of my favorite podcasters, Aww. and the show Black Sales is a lot of fun, and like Ravi said, there's a lot of crossover here. So if you haven't seen the show, check it out, and if you haven't listened to this podcast, you need to. Where can we find your podcast? Well, you can find all of our shows at commonroomradio.com. You could also search for Fathoms Deep on iTunes, Stitcher, and Google Play. All right. Well, thanks, boys, for having us on the show. We can't wait to listen to your next episode. You're very welcome. Anytime. And for the rest of you, enjoy this episode of Hamilton, the podcast. So last week on the podcast, we left you at the midpoint of the world was wide enough. That's right. So Aaron Burr has issued his challenge. He's demanded satisfaction. Alexander Hamilton refused to apologize. So there was need for further action on the shores of Weehawken, New Jersey. And we left you last time having set up the entire duel. We've seen Nathaniel Pendleton as Alexander Hamilton's second. We've seen William P. Van Ness as Aaron Burr's second. They're all four standing there on the shore. Dr. Hosack is sitting in the boats waiting for the call for help. And we have just heard the cast shout, fire. And as this is cried out, the staging comes to almost a complete halt. The woman who plays the bullet on stage that we saw before comes running out to Burr's gun and starts to be that bullet, but just barely moves before coming to a complete freeze. And the lights grow dim. Everything focuses on Hamilton and he starts the soliloquy. I love that effect of the slow moving bullet where the cast member, company member, all in white is holding the bullet and moving it slow motion across the stage, and you watch it in anticipation of what is going to happen. The same effect was used in the first act when Hamilton was at Washington's writing desk, and he's writing for Washington, and you see that there's this bullet that just flies past the head of Hamilton and does not stop him. And so if you don't know what's happening here, and everyone in the audience does, because Burr has in the first song told us he's going to shoot Hamilton. But if you didn't know, this anticipation is building and building and building just because the bullet is going toward him and it's in slow motion and it's embodied by the company member. That's right. And the inspiration behind this part of the musical was actually to build that anticipation, that wondering of, is this going to happen? Lin-Manuel Miranda actually referenced Romeo and Juliet saying, we all know how this ends. And yet the way it's written, you still go, is she going to get up? Is she going to get up? Oh, no. And it's that feeling of anxiety there. 
originally in these lyrics, everything was a definite statement that Hamilton says here. And he later changed it to be that questioning, that wondering as he goes. So you as an audience member, whether you know it's coming or not, question, is this going to be what ends him? Is this going to be his death? Right. I love the questioning aspect of Hamilton's inquiries here when he's talking about maybe the last face I ever see. If I throw away my shot, is this how you remember me? He's thinking about his legacy in this potentially the last moment of his life. And he has his entire life flash before his eyes. And he's singing here, not exactly singing, but he's speaking to the audience in the soliloquy, saying the thoughts that are flashing through his mind before the bullet ever makes contact. And to give credit where credit's due, Lin-Manuel said that Oscar Eustace was the one that convinced him to do that. And Lin-Manuel said specifically that even when you know what's going to happen, you want the audience to still gasp. That's how you know it's done well. And you can read a little bit more about that in the Hamilton. We encourage you to pick one up. Right. Our friends at the Story Wonk podcast have said before and made arguments before about how a well-written and well-told story can't be ruined by spoilers. They talk, they talk about how if you know what's going to happen, if it's still performed well and told to you well, and it's done in such a captivating way that you are in that moment right then, you can go back to a story you've seen before that you know how it's going to end and it still captivates your emotions and it sweeps you right along with it. And in this moment, we know what's going to happen to Hamilton, but it's still chilling. As we dive into these lyrics, I would like to say first there's going to be a lot of references to things that have already happened in the musical, a lot of references to things that we've already covered. A lot of things are coming full circle here, and I think we even mentioned this last episode, but a lot of things are getting fulfilled that were foreshadowed. So just expect that. We're going to try to breeze through those when they come up. Right. So we're not going to give you a whole new episode about Rise Up or a whole new episode about the references back to my shot, but we will try to point back to them whenever we do get the chance. Hamilton says, I imagine death so much it feels more like a memory. Obvious reference callback there. Is this where it gets me? On my feet? Several feet ahead of me? Changing the line slightly from what we've seen before. That's right. In my shot, we saw a 19-year-old Alexander Hamilton who was already talking about death. He had come from an island where he knew that some people got half as many years to live. He had his own mother die when he was in her arms. And so he had confronted death. He knew that he was going to die one day, but he was obsessed with the idea of people telling his story after he died. He was obsessed with the legacy and what he might leave when he did pass away. And so the lyrics that were changed there, he starts speculating on how he would die. He'll say like, in my sleep, or maybe seven feet ahead of me in the Battle of Yorktown, he's rushing off into war and he's going onto the battlefield in glory. And he says, maybe I'm going to die on my feet, the enemy ahead of me, and that's when it's going to come. But here he says, here I am with Aaron Burr facing me on my feet several feet ahead of me. And I I like the way that that progress comes along, but this has been planted in the musical this entire time. His legacy has been one consuming passion, has been an obsession of his life. And here we get to see how his life is going to end because he has talked about death so much. And here it is. And with this next line, I see it coming. Do I run or fire my gun or let it be? Combining with that, I like that Hamilton as a bullet shot, his mind can work fast enough to imagine death as the bullets flying toward him and imagine these things. And what should I do? Should I run? Should I just let it happen? Yeah. I like that. I imagine the uh, Sherlock mind palace where he has to fix something really quickly. And so he thinks escapes into his mind palace where he can work outside of the context of where he is. And Dr. Who in the latest season had a moment where the doctor escapes into his own mind palace, trying to solve problems. And so you see this moment where time kind of slows down. I think a lot of us have been in situations where we feel as if time is just frozen and we see everything around us at once. And it's like you're living in that moment slowly, not sure of what's going to happen. And in this moment, Hamilton asks the question, I see it coming now. I see this bullet coming to me. And he has the fight, flight, or freeze options in front of him. And Hamilton throughout this musical has been the guy who said, I'm not going to throw away my shot. We've seen his hesitancy now to take a shot. And so there is that anticipation of how is he going to respond to this? Is he going to respond like that 19 year old Alexander Hamilton would have? Or is this a new Hamilton we're seeing on stage? Someone who has grown and changed this next line. There is no beat. No melody calls back to my shot where he says death like a beat without a melody. And like we mentioned, the music drops out here. 
the New Yorker actually wrote an article talking about how Lin-Manuel Miranda came up with this idea to drop the music here. He was watching his infant son sleep one morning and he was trying to decide what he should do with this part of the musical. And he realized this was one of the quietest moments he'd ever experienced in his life. And that feeling behind that quiet. And he decided to leave his music behind his headphones behind as he went out to write that day and write this without a beat and a melody. Right. He had a comment in the Hamilton directly discussing that too. Lin Manuel Miranda discusses that moment when he had his infant son sleeping on his chest when he was trying to write this final soliloquy in the musical. And the only thing he could hear was the breathing of his son and his dog was sitting nearby. And he thinks the only thing we've not done in this musical is silence. We've not done the waiting and the quiet. And so he, he thought this would be the appropriate moment to fit that in. Burr, my first friend, my enemy. And we did cover that in the previous episode, talking about that first friend, not necessarily historical, but for our music purpose here, it was his first connection stateside. Yeah. When he's on American soil, Aaron Burr is the guy that Alexander Hamilton seeks out. He's the first person he pursues and he's looking for some common ground, some camaraderie. And then he finds the camaraderie in people like John Lawrence, Hercules Mulligan, and Marquis de Lafayette. But Aaron Burr is the first place he looks for that friendship. And this will come up again, but as Burr aged, he referred back to Hamilton as my friend whom I shot. Right. It's kind of that morbid sense of humor there where he brings it up in all of his correspondence talking about how he'll give public speeches later and he'll reference Hamilton as my friend whom I shot. And it's kind of that lighthearted way of taking a really serious topic and treating it jovially, but kind of morbid at the same time. Maybe the last face I ever see historically and in our lyrics here, the last face he's going to see is both Angelica and Eliza. Yeah, but in this moment, he doesn't know. He's confronting the possibilities of what could happen here. He doesn't know if this bullet is going to take his life instantly and right. he'll fall immediately and be beyond, be beyond salvation in that moment. He, but you're right. Historically, and we will see in a couple moments, that he will be shot and he will be taken across the Hudson. He will stay in John Church's house. And the following day at 2 p.m. is when his death will be announced. And Hamilton, always thinking of his legacy, says... In this line, if I throw away my shot, is this how you'll remember me? What if this bullet is my legacy? Speaking to Burr specifically, saying, if you kill me, this is how you'll remember me. Me throwing away my shot as you shoot me and kill me. And also to people throughout history looking back on Hamilton. Is this how the world will remember him? The theme of legacy in Hamilton and American Musical is absolutely essential. That is one of the most driving threads throughout this story. The theme of legacy is absolutely exponentially important. And you see that from the beginning of this musical that Hamilton is being told, you have no control who will live to tell your story. You can write and write and write, but you can't control the narrative that others are going to tell about you. History has its eyes on you, Hamilton, and you can control certain things, but you can't control your entire legacy. And it's almost as if this musical has been showing us his attempts to create a legacy story for himself, and then the media's attention trying to paint him one way, or Jefferson's attention trying to paint him another way, or people trying to give competing stories to what is the legacy of Alexander Hamilton. And we see in this moment that Hamilton's coming to grips with the fact that, oh yeah, what Washington told me is true that we can't control our entire legacy. We can't control everything about this. And so that next line, what is a legacy? It's planting seeds in a garden you never get to see. Hamilton's saying here that you can just plant the best seeds you can, do the best things you can in life, spend your time doing the best possible things you can, and hope that the right people tend the garden of your legacy. This is one of the most tragic pieces of Hamilton's story to me because he takes pride in what others said about him, but he also struggles because that is also out of his control. He wants people to say good things about him, but he can't control whether people say good things about him. It leads him to be irrational at times. You think about the Reynolds pamphlet and how he, he writes these things to try to defend himself, but then he's, he's so obsessed with what people think about him that it distorts his priorities sometimes. And so this line itself, what is a legacy? It's planting seeds in a garden you never get to see is honestly my favorite lyric in this entire musical. I have other poetic lyrics that stand out to me that I think are just more fascinating, like, 
if Washington isn't going to listen to discipline dissonance, this is the difference. This kid is out. That's just fun. To be Diggs right. is great. Or uh, <laughs> well, It's fun because the way it's performed, the way it's written, but this one carries a weight behind it. Yes, this carries so much weight, so much more weight than the the lyrics of meddling in the middle of a military mess, a game of chess. Like This is fun throughout the entire musical, and it's meaningful through the entire musical, but this one, even though it doesn't have that lyrical weight, it has the entire weight of the theme of the entire musical put here. And so since this is my favorite lyric in the musical, I mentioned this to you, Venton, a couple months ago. Right. Because you asked me, hey, what is your favorite lyric in Hamilton, an American musical? And I thought you were just asking for no reason whatsoever. I thought you were just curious because <laughs> you're my friend. And so I, I texted you my thoughts somewhat, went back and forth. I said, this is my favorite lyric. And it turns out you were asking because one of our mutual friends was making a gift for me. Daphne Olive from Common Room Radio's Fathom Steep podcast is a jewelry maker, and she makes a lot of fascinating jewelry and trinkets and really creative things. And she made me a keychain with the logo of Hamilton on it, and she engraved into it, what is a legacy? It's planting seeds in a garden. You never get to see it. Changed me so much when I got that gift. It was so meaningful to me. I carry it around a lot. It is so important, and I love that lyric, and I want to just publicly thank Daphne for sending that to me. It just means so much. So he continues on with this idea of legacy, saying that I wrote some notes at the beginning of a song, Someone Will Sing For Me. And America has been described before as a symphony that's getting written and played at the same time. And the notes change and people from different cultures come in as the different instruments change things and the different melodies change things. And that's really descriptive to me of what Hamilton's talking about here. He did set up so much in our country that's now still getting played through, still echoing through the music that continues on in our history. Right. To describe our country as a great unfinished symphony is so important because you hear these other voices coming in. And it it tells me that as we live in the middle of this fugue where so many different melodies are being sung back and forth, and sometimes there's some dissonance in the music of American politics where we talk back and forth and spew some really hateful melodies back and forth with each other. But we also get to understand that we today are living inside of this symphony. The words we say to one another are a part of the American story. The words we say to each other are part of the symphony that are going to be either softly spoken in the background of the musical or they're going to be loudly proclaimed. And it's interesting that he's talking about how the legacy that I'm leaving is one thing, but there's this legacy that is America and it's ongoing and it's going to outlive me. He said in the beginning of this musical, I want to build something that's going to outlive me. And here he's talking about something he helped to build that will ultimately outlive him by a far long time. And that's what we're living today. We get to live in this America that is Hamilton's legacy, the monument to him. And we're a part of that. It's also interesting to look at this line from a meta level because Lin-Manuel Miranda playing Hamilton wrote this musical, but doesn't actually perform the final song. (laughs) Yeah, that's true. And additionally, it's like callback to the beginning of this musical where we said America sings for you. Here he's talking about the song that's being sung. And as Robbie mentioned that line, America, you great unfinished symphony, you sent for me. You let me make a difference. I love the way that line is delivered with such gusto. Yeah, you see here that Hamilton is looking back and he is proud of his accomplishments and rightly so. And he says that America is a place where even orphan immigrants can leave their fingerprints and rise up. He says that this thing that you let me do is a part of the American story. It's a part of the American DNA that the American dream is that a kid who has no prospects when he came into the world can rise up, can climb the ladder of success and can make a name for himself. He has made a difference in America because of his drive, his ambition, his help, his community, his family. And we remember the name of Hamilton because of what he's been able to do. And he says that rise up the same way he did in my shot. And it goes to, I'm running out of time. I'm running and my time's up. Wise up. Eyes up. I just love the way that line's put together. I do too. And throughout the musical, we've asked the question, why do you write like you're running out of time? Exactly. And here we find out he was running out of time. That is why. To put it the way that Ron Chernow puts it toward the end of his biography, he says, because of his untimely death at 49, Hamilton has retained a freshness in our historical memory. He never lived to grow gray or acquire the stiff dignity of an elder statesman. Somehow it's impossible to imagine Hamilton as an old man, Catherine Dinker Bowen once wrote. Even his 
hard-headedness and relentless skepticism showed a quality not of caution, but of youthful daring, careless defiance. And Chernow goes on and he does describe how the life expectancy at that period of time was only about 55. So Hamilton really didn't die young, so to speak, for his contemporaries. But when we have an impression of Hamilton that's compared to our early political figures in American history, you consider that the first eight American presidents lived with an average age of about 80 years old, with only Washington failing to reach his 70th birthday. And so the first eight presidents lived a really long time. Put next to that Hamilton's life of 49 years, and it is dwarfed by people like Adams and Jefferson. And even Burr, who would live 32 years after this duel. I do like this wise up, the eyes up. It reminds you of what's happening in the moment. He's supposed to look him in the eye and no higher. And he's going to be lifting his hand to throw away that shot. But he maybe also is lifting his eyes toward heaven. He's, he's seeing what's coming. And we'll get to see that here as he says, I catch a glimpse of the other side. Yeah, it's like he's raising his eyes up to meet Burr, but he keeps going higher and higher. And he raises his eyes up to catch the other side, and he sees the people that mean so much to him, that are on the other side of that veil, so to speak. And he says, Lawrence, John Lawrence, his friend from Act One, who meant so much to him, his most intimate friend in his whole life, save maybe Eliza herself. He says that Lawrence is leading a soldier's chorus on the other side. So Lawrence comes out on stage looking angelic, dressed in white. And when Hamilton says, my son is on the other side, Anthony Ramos changes his persona slightly since he played his son as well. I just love that dual acting there. I like that too. And in the line, my son is on the other side. To me, it beckons back to earlier in this song when Aaron Burr is narrating what matters to him. And he says, I only have one thought before the slaughter. This man will not make an orphan of my daughter. And so it's almost the mirror of motives here where Aaron Burr says, I'm not going to die because I have a daughter to live for. And Alexander says, my son is on the other side, so if I die, I get to see him again. And in both of those lines, you hear their passion because their voice cracks and breaks. Oh, for sure. I like that he does see the peacefulness of the other side. So Lawrence is leading the soldier's chorus, and then his son is with my mother on the other side. So it's like his mother, who never got to meet any of Hamilton's sons, who never even got to see Hamilton rise up and become a man, She is now there enjoying the presence of young Philip Hamilton, who is there beside her. And it's like his whole family is going to be there on the other side. And he's thinking about all these people who mean a lot to him, like his mother and his son and John Lawrence. And then he brings up his mentor, George Washington, who is watching from the other side. And almost crying out to him, he says, teach me how to say goodbye. A reference back to when Washington taught us all how to say goodbye from the presidency, he's saying, You've already left this mortal coil, and I'm on my way out. Show me how to do this. Just a cry out to him in that last second. Right. To me, it makes me think of a couple mentors that I have specifically in my mind who have passed away, and I can no longer ask them any questions. I look back on their life, and I know that they were so meaningful, and I learned from them while they were here, but I can't go back and say, hey, how can you help me through the situation where I am now? I can look back on their legacy and try to remember the stories they taught me, but I didn't appreciate them as much as I do now. And I imagine that Hamilton here is remembering his encounters with Washington, where he really didn't appreciate George Washington as much as everyone else did in the moment. He he understood that he needed to hitch his wagon to George Washington so he could rise up to fame, but he was pretty belligerent towards Washington in a couple of our scenes, not really terribly respectful. But here is an older Hamilton who looks back and understands the importance of George Washington's leadership And I appreciate like what you said, he is beckoning that George Washington's words will come back to him, that he can understand more of Washington's meaning and that Washington will somehow give him the motivation to say goodbye well and to finish his life strongly and with his honor intact and with his dignity there. And so all of these people that mean so much to him who have passed away are there. And it's almost like he's painting this mosaic of how when he passes away, it's going to be so beautiful because everybody I love is there. Except there's one person that he does really, really, really love who is not on the other side yet. And so he says, rise up, rise up, rise up, like he's going to climb up the ladder to heaven, the stairway to heaven. But then the word that means so much to us, Eliza. Yeah, and I feel like up until this point, 
It's this anxiety of dealing with, how am I going to deal with death? Washington, teach me how to do this. I'm so freaked out right now. And then when he says Eliza, the calm comes in. And a short note on that rise up, he is saying, I feel like rise up. I'm rising up. As you rise up to heaven, it's also a cry out to Eliza. Eliza, rise up, take my place, carry on this legacy. But as he's thinking of Eliza, and he says, my love, take your time. I'll see you on the other side. He has that calm. He calms down there. And I feel like it's a fulfillment to Eliza's desire earlier in the musical when she says, if I could grant you peace of mind, if you could let me inside your heart, it's thinking of her that brings him peace and knowing that everything's going to be okay with his legacy. And as we reach the end of this silent soliloquy without any beat or melody, and we're all the way back now to the very beginning of the musical where he and his friends were raising a glass to freedom toasting the Revolutionary War, singing about this. It's almost like he's gone through his entire life. This is the moment where his life has flashed before his eyes, and he finds so much meaning and comfort and consolation in what he's gone through. And trust in Eliza, like you said, that she will carry on and tell his story at the end of this musical. And the final line he sings there with the raise your glass to freedom is where he started this musical, and it's where he's ending this musical. Right. I really like too, compared to the next line, we're going to jump back to Burr's perspective of things and time's going to come back to full speed. Burr's going to say he aims his pistol at the sky just right after Hamilton says, raise a glass to freedom, almost as if he's toasting with his gun as he holds it up to the sky to shoot. Yes. In that trademark Hamilton logo. Yes. With just like our logo. Gun aiming towards the sky. It's so meaningful that he's toasting there with the gun almost. And I should mention With the ensemble, throughout that soliloquy, they're kind of dancing around slowly. They'll come to complete stops in weird positions and hold these weird positions to show you that time is coming to a stop. Time is going very slowly, at least. Right. It's like they're setting up these different tableau scenes where they run from one scene to the next and they freeze there commemorating his wartime experience or going back and forth. At one moment in this soliloquy, he walks to the center of the stage and steps onto a soapbox like he's reliving those days of his life. And you see the ensemble behind him and the the bullet is still moving right. and it gets really, really close to him while he's standing there on the soapbox and he just in time steps off to continue the rest of his soliloquy, almost as if the bullet's going to catch him, but he has a few more things he wants to relive before he gets there. And so that that whole cast, the whole ensemble is dancing in these scenes, setting up the tableaus, helping him relive all of those moments. And, and I have to show a lot of respect to these ensemble members because when you're dancing without the beat or the melody, it, it, you have to keep that rhythm going in your head. You have to memorize the lines that you're doing this on. We're going to hit this marker at exactly the time that Lin-Manuel Miranda sings this line. And so you have some really good choreography, some great talent on Broadway. Whether you're on the playbill as a lead with a name or whether you're a dancer in the background or whether you're just behind the scenes in the catwalk or whatever, there's so much talent that's happening on Broadway and we don't want to forget or fail to recognize any of those people from the first person who opens the door and sweeps the steps to the people like Lin-Manuel Miranda. There's so much talent there. So much hard work goes into these shows. And I think this is one of those moments where you see that the emotional impact of this soliloquy is brought so much more to the front with those people dressed in white setting up those tableaus. Absolutely. We don't get to talk about those people very often in the podcast, but we do want to take this moment right now and just say a big hand to them and everything they do to put all this together. So like I mentioned, Burr is going to break in here when Hamilton finishes. It's going to come back to full speed time. And he says, he aims his pistol at the sky and Burr screams, wait, throughout this musical, Hamilton and Burr have had these ways of thinking and these ways that they do things. Burr waits for it and Hamilton's not throwing away a shot and he's always going. And here it culminates in this switch where finally Burr is like, I'm not waiting. I'm not waiting anymore. And Hamilton's throwing away his shot. And it has dire consequences to where the last minute when Burr makes that decision, immediately he throws out that regretful, wait, that's not my personality. I shouldn't have done that. Yes, I I appreciate that that response to the fact that we now see the character arcs have gone full circle for each other. You almost imagine that Aaron Burr started in one spot, Hamilton started in another spot. They've arced towards each other, and they've both finished in exactly the same place where the other one at least was philosophically in that moment. Lin-Manuel Miranda refers to them as twin souls in this moment. That's appropriate, I think. I also like to think about this 
particular lyric where he shouts wait as a bit of a collision between Aaron Burr, the narrator of our story and Aaron Burr, the one who is in the action, right? Because he's consistently bounced back and forth throughout this musical as someone who has more details than the rest of the characters on stage. Cause he's narrating what's happening. I mean, when the Mariah Reynolds affair comes in, he's saying, this is what's happening, but I guess I'll let him tell it. And he's letting other people take the rest of the story. But in this moment, you see some of the elder Burr looking back on this moment, reflecting on it, and sending a little bit of regret there, almost. And we'll talk in a second about whether Aaron Burr ever really expressed a lot of regret, because he didn't, a lot. There were a couple moments that we will get to where it's worth discussing his regret. But there's so much gravity in the word wait when Aaron Burr shouts it after the bullets fired. And it's interesting to me, at this point, the Aaron Burr sir music is going to start coming back in. And it mirrors this whole musical. The musical starts with a song about Alexander Hamilton's legacy and who he was and who he will be. And then the next song is a song where Aaron Burr and Alexander Hamilton come together for a change of fate, a change of history of what's going to happen between these two men coming together. And our musical ends here, second to last song, with their last meeting together and how that's going to change history. And then the song after that is one about Alexander Hamilton's legacy. Yes, the mirror form of these two acts is brilliant. You see the storytelling devices that are put into this. You announce the legacy, and then you have Aaron Burr and Hamilton together. You have Aaron Burr and Hamilton together, and then you describe his legacy at the end. It, it's wonderful. It happens throughout this musical in multiple ways, and I think we're going to have an episode coming up soon where we get to just discuss the storytelling aspects, the technical devices that are used inside of Hamilton as a story, and I'm really excited to do that. We're hoping to have a couple guests on who are some experts in this area to discuss this with us, and we'll give you some more information about it later. But right here, that one device is so, so perfect. And much like in the Philip Hamilton duel, at this point, there's that bass note of a heartbeat in the background up until Hamilton's going to pass away. Right. One of the differences here is that the bass beat is erratic because he is now shot and he's got adrenaline pumping through his veins. He collapses and he's on his deathbed and we don't know what's going to happen. And his bass beat that represents his heartbeat is going to come and go and skip a couple beats here and there. And as Chernow talks about what the bullet did, the bullet had fractured a rib on the right side, ripped through Hamilton's liver and diaphragm, and splintered the second lumbar vertebrae, coming to rest in his spine. And as Burr says, I walk toward him, but I am ushered away, which is historically accurate from what we know from statements. And it is said that he had a look of regret on his face. That's right. That description comes from a joint statement that William P. Van Ness and Nathaniel Pendleton put out a couple days after Hamilton's death when he passed away. There were a lot of points of disagreement between the two of them about who shot first, Hamilton or Burr, what went on between them, did Hamilton throw a shot away, what happened. There's a lot of controversy there, but they did get together and the two of them sat down and put this joint statement out there where they used the phrase, Colonel Burr then advanced towards General Hamilton with a manner and gesture that appeared to General Hamilton's friend to be expressive of regret. But without speaking, turned about and withdrew, being urged from the field by his friend, as has been subsequently stated, with the view to prevent his being recognized by the surgeon and the bargemen who were then approaching. So the idea there is that Burr walks towards Hamilton with regret in his face, and he wants to comfort his friend, comfort his enemy in this moment, see what's going on, see what the result is. But in this moment, Nathaniel Pendleton has called for the doctor. He's called to get Hamilton help, and Burr if he's seen there on the site, remember the whole point of having the doctor away is so that there is no witness to this. Yeah, you can no longer have deniability if the person who shot your patient runs up to him. That's true. Historically, William P. Van Ness takes an umbrella and uses it to shield Aaron Burr's face from the boatmen and from Dr. Hosack who are running to the scene so that no one can see exactly who it is that shot Alexander Hamilton, even though, I mean, everybody knew. There was no question whatsoever right. about who knew. But they had to at least preserve the facade of the deniability there, the plausible deniability for the doctor and the boatmen who were supposed to be kept out of this encounter somewhat. And so in the lyrics, Aaron Burr tells us he walks towards him, but he's ushered away. They row him back across the Hudson. And there was this interesting quote to me from Leslie Odom Jr. when he actually visited the site of the duel, where he said the thing that stuck out in his mind so much was how long they had to have rowed to get across the Hudson. 
He said, dying the whole way. That resonated with me. There's no ambulance. There are no paramedics. It's just time. It took Hamilton a day to die. Not having seen the location myself, personally been there, just thinking about how long you have to row and you're just suffering in that boat the whole time. You're not being rushed off to a hospital to be fixed. It's just that long waiting to die. I can only imagine how terrible that type of a boat ride would have been without modern technology, without any type of speedboat engine and motor on the edge of this boat to get across the Hudson, to, to get to a place where he could have a better treatment. As I understand it, Dr. Hosack was still afraid to even take Hamilton's shirt off his back because of how much pain he was in. He was obviously so devastated during this whole boat ride. And Burr says, I get a drink. And now we know getting a drink can mean two different things. If you just see it written, like going to get a drink can mean that you're celebrating something or that you're washing away sorrows of something. And in the Broadway recording that we have, obviously Burr is expressing his sorrow here when he says, I get a drink in the tone that he says it. Well, I've read actually that in the Broadway performance every night, he changes it from night to night, how he expresses this line. Sometimes he does it like a stone cold killer. And other times he does it like a morning friend. I like the ambiguity there that it could go either way because this is one of those moments in history that a lot of people have presented in multiple ways. And in history, we do know that Burr went off to have breakfast with a relative afterwards and never even mentioned that he was in a duel during that breakfast. He just acted like everything was fine and normal. Right. So Aaron Burr, when he does go across the Hudson again and he gets back to his house, he had a a young cousin of his that had joined him for breakfast who had kind of given him a surprise visit and he hosts him like a good host and doesn't really bring up the fact that he, oh, by the way, I may have just murdered the former treasury secretary of the United States. I may have just murdered the leader of the Federalist Party. Uh, I'm not sure what's going on there. He just has this whole dinner conversation. <laughs> and in the middle of that is when at the Tontine Coffee House downtown New York City, a sign goes up, a bulletin board goes up that says, General Hamilton was shot by Colonel Burr this morning in a duel. The general is said to be mortally wounded. And so after this breakfast meeting with his relative at his house, this relative leaves and finds someone in the streets. And this person runs up to him and says, have you heard, have you heard, have you heard the news? Aaron Bird just shot Alexander Hamilton. And the guy's like, what are you talking about? There's, right. there's no way. I just left Burr's house. He fed me pancakes, I imagine, because that's the best breakfast food there is. <laughs> Sorry, all you waffle fans out there. I'm a waffle fan. <laughs> a podcast divided. Podcast divided. A, a waffle is basically a pancake with a syrup I trap. challenge you to a duel. Oh, no. <laughs> I, I might apologize. I don't know. I don't know if I want to die for this. But his cousin could not believe that Burr had just ended someone's life in a duel. Right. He was absolutely incredulous that that would have happened in that moment. And after the breakfast, apparently Aaron Burr did send Dr. Hosek a letter saying, hey, how is Alexander Hamilton doing? I have sincere hopes that he will heal from this. And so he expressed in a letter to Hosek that he was inquiring about his condition and he wanted to figure out the result of what his bullet had done. But that whole breakfast conversation had to have been surreal for that cousin that had visited. The company here comes in with these awes at this moment. And Burr says, I hear wailing in the streets. And Chernow quotes some people from the time here about the reaction of the community. Quote, the feelings of the whole community are agonized beyond description. Oliver Wilcott Jr. told his wife, New Yorkers of the era never forgot the extravagant spectacle of sadness. The pervasive grief. Even Burr's friend Charles Biddle conceded that, quote, there was as much or more lamentation as when General Washington died. And Lin-Manuel Miranda had said before that he wrote a song about Washington's death that didn't actually make it into the performance. That's right. Where, according to him, the song began with Burr singing, I hear wailing in the streets. So this would have been a call back to Washington's death. Oh, right. I like that. Because it is such a monumental moment when you see the death of someone as important as Alexander Hamilton. And apparently this was the biggest funeral in New York City history when Alexander Hamilton did die because the city was wearing black bands for days. They flew their flags at half-mast for a long period of time. And it was the biggest New York City person who had passed away. And so the city was absolutely in mourning for a long period of time. So as far as the timetable goes, Alexander Hamilton was shot on July 11th, had his death July 12th at 2 p.m., had his funeral July 14th, a few days later, and then the seconds got together and started putting out their joint statements on 
July 17th, then the 19th, Pendleton put his response out even further, and Van Ness put his response out even further. So the newspapers were talking about this for days, right. for a really long period of time. One of the things I'd like to dive into about the description of the community's response is about the funeral procession itself. A couple days after Hamilton dies, you see that Chernow's description goes as such. That Saturday morning, guns fired from the battery, church bells rang with a doleful sound, and ships in the harbor flew their colors at half-mast. Around noon, to the somber thud of military drums, New York militia units stood out at the head of the funeral procession, bearing their arms in reverse position, their muzzles pointed downward. Numerous clergymen and members of the Society of the Cincinnati trooped behind them. Then came the most affecting sight of all, preceded by two small black boys in white turbans, eight pallbearers shouldered Hamilton's corpse, set in a rich mahogany casket with his hat and sword perched on the top. Hamilton's gray horse trailed behind with the boots and spurs of its former rider reversed in the stirrups. Then came Hamilton's four eldest sons and other relatives, followed by representatives of every segment of New York society, physicians, lawyers, politicians, foreign diplomats, military officers, bankers, merchants, Columbia College students and professors, ship captains, mechanics, and artisans. Collectively, they symbolized the richly diversified economic and political mosaic that Hamilton had envisaged for America. And so you see here in the funeral procession, all of these different people from all of these different backgrounds were coming out to show respect and grief at the passing of Alexander Hamilton, arguably New York City's most recognizable name, New York City's most notable citizen had now passed away. And one newspaper spoke about it saying that the sternest powers, the bloodiest villain could not resist the melting scene that was his funeral. And in the Evening Post, which was Hamilton's own New York Evening Post, it said that the scene was enough to melt a monument of marble, talking about how affected this whole community was at the death and passing and funeral of Alexander Hamilton. So seeing the community's reaction to this and knowing that dueling was technically illegal, you can understand why Burr says here, somebody tells me you better hide. The hatred and vitriol was so intense towards Aaron Burr that when Gouverneur Morris was asked to write the funeral oration for Alexander Hamilton's ceremony, he wrote a speech, but he knew that as soon as he mentioned the name Aaron Burr or hinted at the idea of a duel or a gun, that the entire crowd might riot and might get so angry at this villain of Aaron Burr that he didn't, he wanted to avoid that entirely. He wanted to make it to where the scene was not going to turn into a mob fighting against Aaron Burr because that was the tension of New York City at the time. Everyone was after Aaron Burr. Everyone was looking for him. And so that hatred towards him was something that would eventually send Aaron Burr into a bit of an exile where he was indicted for murder in both New York state and New Jersey. And, and he would leave the country and he would eventually leave the country. First, he goes on a tour of the Western States, but we'll get into that in a future episode. He continues on and says, they say, and to me, that's a small callback to King George saying, they say, but more importantly, it's more of that thought of you don't control who tells your story, how history sees you. History has its eyes on you. And Everything throughout history, we're just talking about things that we're looking back on, collecting letters and doing this research, but none of us were, quote, in the room where it happened. We weren't there when the duel went down. And Angelica joins Burr as they both sing Angelica and Eliza. And Angelica drops out and Burr says, we're both at his side when he died. I almost imagine that as Angelica being so affected that she was going to sing that whole sentence with him. Angelica and Eliza, but then the man that meant so much to her throughout her entire life, the man who was her obsession throughout so many days, the one whose eyes kept her up at night, has passed away and she can't even finish the sentence to say, I was at his side when he died. And as he says, when he died, a bell rings and that bass heartbeat stops. And I'd just like to read a quick quote from Chernow again. I know we, we do this a lot, but about his death and Eliza and Angelica quote, Eliza sat devotedly at her husband's bedside, fanning his feverish face. Angelica church hastened to succor the man who had been her obsession for so many years. Governor Morris would 
Remember an inconsolable Angelica, quote, weeping her heart out. She expressed her profound admiration for Eliza in the face of such intolerable adversity. Speaking about Angelica and Eliza being both at his side when he died, I'd like to spend a couple minutes talking about the deathbed of Alexander Hamilton, because it's such an emotional moment in history, and it is such a climactic experience in his own life. And so I'd I'd like to talk somewhat about that. So Eliza, like we had discussed in this musical, had been kept out of the loop about this entire duel. Right. She didn't know that her husband was going off to Weehawken to face his potential death. So when he comes across the Hudson and he's kind of coming in and out of it and Dr. Hosek's trying to treat his wounds, at first Hamilton suffered such exquisite pain that Hosek didn't strip off his bloody garments, but just kind of treated them with weak wine and water. And then eventually when he was complaining about back comfort, the, uh, doctor took off his clothes and darkened the room and started giving him some opium-based painkillers and things to kind of dull the pain. But he kept asking for Eliza and sent for her and said, send for Eliza, but don't tell her immediately everything that happened. Break the news to her slowly. So when people sent for Eliza, who was still uptown at the Grange, who hadn't been at the downtown area where Hamilton was taken to John Church's house, They send for Eliza and tell her that her husband is suffering spasms, just generically, right? and tell her that she should come to his side. And gradually as she comes, she's told a couple more details and a couple more details. And at first she trusted this this fiction and everyone was afraid to tell her more, as I imagine anyone would be, because you don't want to be the person that bears that news. Absolutely not. Because Hamilton knew as soon as he was shot that this was a mortal blow to him. And that this was probably the end of his life. And so when Eliza finally does find out the entire truth, Dr. Hosack says that she was half distracted and gave way to frantic grief. And to comfort her, Hamilton kept saying those words that he had written in the July 4th letter to her that we read in the last episode, but she hadn't read that letter yet. And he kept comforting her with these words. Remember, my Eliza, you are a Christian. There's more to this. This isn't the end of my story. This isn't the end of our relationship. This isn't the end of everything. You're a Christian. Trust God in this moment. Trust your faith. Fly to the bosom of your God. And Dr. Hosek says he kept repeating that mantra to her to calm her, to comfort her, and to ease her. And speaking about her Christian faith, there was another encounter on his deathbed where Hamilton wanted to receive the rites of Last Communion before he passed away. Right. Hamilton here is focused on spiritual matters, and he is going to call for this bishop so he can receive communion. We've talked about throughout this musical and throughout Hamilton's life how his religious affections have ebbed and flowed, and he's gone back and forth on how devoted he was to those beliefs. And here, the, people can still argue that he was just putting on a face, putting on an image for his legacy, but I think it's more likely at the end of one's life they're coming to terms with what they believe about what comes after. And he calls for that bishop to take communion. Right. And so he calls for Reverend Benjamin Moore, who's the Episcopal Bishop there at Trinity Church in New York City. He's also the president of Columbia College, interestingly enough, for another little overlap with his life. And he calls this bishop and asks him to administer the rites of Holy Communion to him. But Bishop Moore is so hesitant to do it. He says he has two reservations. First of all, he thought that dueling was an impious practice, so despicable that he didn't want to possibly be perceived as sanctioning this confrontation with Burr and Hamilton. He didn't want to be seen as someone that was a collaborator or someone that approved of it. And so he wanted to be able to distance himself from dueling as a practice. But he also knew that Hamilton was not a regular churchgoer. Yeah, we mentioned before about how Eliza was going to church and taking the kids to church, but Hamilton himself didn't often go to the church. Right. So Hamilton is rejected by Bishop Moore. And in this moment, Hamilton apparently on his deathbed, except for one key moment, was very confident and very calm and very collected in all of his thoughts and all of his articulations and in his correspondence with people. But in this confrontation, he says, okay, Bishop Moore will not administer the rights to me. I'm going to call on my other pastoral friend who is... Reverend John M. Mason of the Scotch Presbyterian Church. So remember, Hamilton grew up Presbyterian, converted to the Episcopal faith, became Episcopalian, and so now he's calling his friend who's a Presbyterian, and he says, hey, my dear friend, 
I want you to give me the rite of communion. I want you to administer this at my deathbed. And this guy is a man who revered Hamilton as a politician. He was a Federalist respecter who appreciated Hamilton's contributions. He was a family friend. And John Mason looked at Hamilton on his deathbed and said, it breaks my heart to receive a request. It gives him, quote unquote, unutterable pain to receive from Hamilton any request that he could not grant. Because he says to him, it's a principle in our church never to administer the Lord's Supper privately to any person under any circumstances. So there's a little bit of church history in this situation where you see that the Episcopal Church is willing to take communion in a private setting and do things in a little bit different way. You see communion and the Lord's Supper all used interchangeably as words we talk about in church history and in Christian church and Christian circles. And in the Presbyterian circle, at this point in time, they were still using communion tokens, if you know what those are where they were so afraid of using, of abusing the communion table and these representations or embodiments of the blood and flesh of Jesus Christ in such a way that would be disrespectful or disingenuous. And they were so opposed to doing that, that you had to have a communion token to receive communion in their church at this period of time. And they didn't want to do communion privately because they thought it's called communion. You're supposed to commune, right. Community. commune with one another and commune with the body of Christ and with the uh, with your God himself. And you have this confrontation there. And so Hamilton speaks to his Presbyterian friend who explains to him the doctrine of their faith saying, look, that's not how we do it. I can't be the person that gives you communion because that's against the way our church practices it. And it would have been a pretty severe consequence for him if he was changing the way that communion did happen just for his friend on his deathbed. So he, he didn't do that. Hamilton understood the reservations that Reverend Mason had because of the faith that his church practices. And they had a conversation that was really interesting where Hamilton is getting advice from Mason saying that all men have sinned and were equal in the Lord's sight. Mason's trying to be a pastor to Hamilton, comforting him, saying that we've all sinned, we've all made mistakes. And Hamilton said, quote, I perceive it to be so. I am a sinner. I look to his mercy. And then Hamilton stressed how much he hated dueling, saying, I really wanted to avoid this interview, but I found for some time past that my life must be exposed to this man. I went to the field determined, though, not to take his life. And so Mason talks about how Christ would wash away his sins and this this sin of dueling would be washed from his slate because of God's forgiveness and Christ's blood would wash it away. And there's this whole moment after Reverend Mason is talking to Hamilton about how he will be receiving forgiveness from Christ for his sins. And Hamilton expresses with fervor, with eyes lifted up towards heaven. He says, I have a tender reliance on the mercy of the Almighty through the merits of our Lord Jesus Christ. And as he's struggling for breath in this moment, he promises that if he survives, he will repudiate dueling. So here he's gone through two pastors who will not give him the rite of last communion. So at this point, some of his friends get involved and they say, hey, Bishop Mason, the first guy that Hamilton went to, it's really mean of you to deny a dying man's wishes. Why should you reject the consolation of his Christian faith on his deathbed? And so these people are giving pressure to the bishop and they finally call the bishop back to Hamilton's deathbed when Hamilton, in the true style of a great orator, sits up and gives one final convincing speech to try to convince Bishop Moore that his faith is genuine and that he deserves the right of the Lord's Supper. Right. As you said, the bishop comes back in, willing to reconsider, and Hamilton sits up and he says, my dear sir, you perceive my unfortunate situation and no doubt have been made acquainted with the circumstances which led to it. It is my desire to receive the communion at your hands. I hope you will not conceive there is any impropriety in my request. Then he added, quote, it has for some time past been the wish of my heart and it was my intention to take an early opportunity of uniting myself to the church by the reception of that holy ordinance. And again, as Robbie said, Hamilton expressed his faith in God's mercy to forgive him and denounced dueling, saying that if he lived past this, that he would fight the custom of dueling. And then he lifted his hands and said, I have no ill will against Colonel Burr. I met him with a fixed resolution to do no harm. I forgive all that happened. 
And it's at this point that Bishop Moore relents and actually gives him the Holy Communion. And Hamilton lays back down and says that he's happy with this. So a lot of Hamilton skeptics will look at this deathbed conversion as a, an excuse for him to kind of get the media on his side, get the public masses to support him, saying in his last moments at least, he was a good Christian man. And so John Adams later on talks about how vice and villainy should not be forgotten for someone's last minute conversion to the Christian faith. And so a lot of people look back on this and question his sincerity in this moment and I remember reading Nancy Eisenberg's book about Aaron Burr called Fallen Founder, and she casts a lot of doubt on that, talking about the fact that two ministers had rejected him, and so he he was obviously not a true Christian person. And to me, it's a little bit low to question someone's faith like that and to question someone's motives across the board. We don't know whether he's just doing this for Eliza's sake to make her feel better about his passing because knowing that he's a Christian will make her feel better as she lives the rest of her life, hoping for that heavenly reunion with him. We just don't know whether this is sincere, fake, truly faithful or what, but I'd like to consider that this is a true sincere person because this is the kind of guy who's always lived with his heart open and he just opens his mouth, says the first things that come to him. He's the kind of guy who gives free ammunition to his enemies because he's always speaking his mind and speaking his heart and is very much a sincere person, even though he's playing the political game across the board. So here he's showing concern for his faith and for his standing before God. He's shown concern for his wife, Eliza. He at one point has his children paraded in front of him and his two-year-old boy, Philip Jr. Remember, they named their youngest son after the elder son who had passed away in the duel. Philip is taken up to his lips for a final kiss, and Eliza lines up their seven children at the foot of his bed so that Hamill can see them in one final scene, a sight that officially renders him speechless, according to the spectators, that he can't contain how emotional he is in this moment, seeing all of his kids right there, his legacy, so to speak, at the foot of his bed, right there, looking at all of them, loving them to death. And the last thing that he's concerned about before he does pass away, he has this this last quote about the politics of what's going on at the time. There's that secessionist movement that we've talked about, splitting the North from the South. And he says in one moment, if they break this union, they will break my heart, which Turnout describes as a fitting political epitaph for Hamilton's life. He worked so hard to unite these states, to fight for their unity and fight for their liberation from Great Britain, so that they could be one United States, and then he establishes their government and wants them to have a strong, centralized federal government, and he says, if if they break this union, they will break my heart, and that's something he's very concerned about. And I just have one final thing to bring up about the reaction of Eliza when she was at the side of Hamilton when he died. After he passes away, she takes a lock of hair from her husband and begins the rites of mourning as a widow in the customs of her day. And she's so tortured with grief that she calls for Governor Morris to come into her room and speak with her. And this line breaks my heart so much when I hear it. But according to David Ogden, who is reporting this situation in this scene, who's a, I think a nephew of Governor Morris, I'm not exactly certain on that, but he's reporting this and he says that she called for Governor Morris. He came in and she burst into tears, told him, He was the best friend her husband had, begged him to join her in prayers for her own death, and then to be a father for her children. Chernow continues, with normally a witty cosmopolitan man and bon vivant, the peg-legged Morris could only stare at Eliza with tears streaming down his cheeks. So this really composed, brave woman is in this moment about to lose it doesn't know how to continue on, and she begs for Governor Morris to pray that she doesn't have to carry on as long as her children are taken care of by him. It's devastating to me. Right. In this moment, she has lost the person that she's loved most in life, and she now has to look forward to a future without him and how to take care of these children, how to pay off the debts that they have, how to feed these kids and raise them by herself and it's too much. And so in history, the deathbed of Alexander Hamilton is an emotionally moving and stirring scene where we see the death of a man who meant so much 
to America, who meant so much to his wife and to his kids, and meant so much to his community when the funeral comes and they surround his family, and you see how much of an impact this man had. In the musical, it's interesting that we don't see the deathbed confessions of Alexander Hamilton, probably because we put a lot of those thoughts into the soliloquy of Hamilton before the gunshot met its target, but also because this, in a certain way, is not exactly the story of Hamilton's death. Burr is the narrator. Burr controls the way that this story is told. Burr, to one degree, is the one who lives to tell Hamilton's story. So when he comes in here and he's talking about Hamilton's legacy and what happens in this scene, it's not about Hamilton. Burr is concerned with his own legacy, and when he's reflecting on the power of death, he's going to talk about how it affects his own personal life, saying, I survived but I paid for it. So let's dive into the last little stanza that Aaron Burr has in our musical in this song and wrap it up for this episode. And as Burr does continue on in the lyrics here, you'll actually notice that heartbeat picks back up because like Robbie just said, this is Burr singing about himself and he's the one that lives on. It's his heartbeat we're hearing now because he's the narrator and he's trying to take the story in his own direction. He brings up that line from previously in the musical, death doesn't discriminate. Between the sinners and the saints, it takes and it takes and it takes. It's interesting that he leaves out, but we keep living anyways because someone did die here. Right, that's true. History obliterates. In every picture, it paints. It paints me and all my mistakes, which, as we've mentioned, history has its eyes on you. History is going to come up with a certain version of events, whether they are exactly accurate or not. It's going to be painted in a certain direction, and he sees where it's going. When Alexander aimed at the sky, he may have been the first one to die, which I really like the way that said, because we all do die. But Burr would live another 32 years. He would grow old with the founding fathers. He may have lived, but Burr is the one who paid for it. He survived, but he paid for it. Now he's the villain in your history. He was too young and blind to see which he wasn't that young. He was 48 at the time of the duel, but he did live another 32 years. And if you view this part of the song as him looking back on his life as an older person nearing his own death, he could look back and say 48 was a young, ignorant me who made choices that I don't agree with now, as we all do as we mature in age. Oh yeah, past Robbie was a moron at times. (laughs) Not always, but at times. He says, I should have known the world was wide enough for both Hamilton and me an actual thing he said toward the end of his life. That's right. So Aaron Burr did not express a lot of regret for having killed Alexander Hamilton in this duel. According to his friend, William P. Van Ness, and according to his own speculation, he didn't have any reason to believe that Alexander Hamilton was going to throw away his shot. So he didn't feel any guilt for what he did in the duel itself. He felt like he conducted himself with honor and he was a noble person who went into this duel just like anyone else. He didn't really have guilt or shame or regret for killing his friend, Alexander Hamilton. But there was a moment when he was doing a public reading of Lawrence Stern's novel called Tristram Shandy. I've never read this book. Have you, Venton? I have not, actually. I actually hadn't heard of the book, but apparently there's this scene where somebody catches this really annoying fly, which makes me think of that Breaking Bad episode where the fly is running right. around. That's what I was thinking of, too, when I was reading about this. <laughs> right. And he catches this fly, but instead of killing the fly, he decides to release it. And the character says, this world surely is wide enough to hold both thee and me. And when Aaron Burr was doing this public reading and he read this particular line, he kind of paused and he had this kind of a side, some people painted as a joke, where he says, you know, if I had read Stern more often and Voltaire less frequently, then I should have known that the world was wide enough for Hamilton and me. It's an interesting thought that he compares Hamilton to an annoying fly there. He's like, I should have just brushed Hamilton off, pushed him to the side, and gone on with my life. Right. He would have known that he could just brush off those accounts instead of taking that challenge from Hamilton as if it mattered and he had to kill him for his own legacy to be continued. But in that moment, Lin-Manuel Miranda has commented on this particular moment in Aaron Burr's life where it seems to be one of the few moments when he might have expressed some type of regret. He may have just done it for the laugh to get the kind of morbid, macabre sense of humor where someone is laughing at something really, really serious. 
But Lin-Manuel Miranda said in reaction to that, that if he was joking, it was a wicked joke. But sometimes the jokes we choose to tell are the ones in which we reveal ourselves. And I think it's telling that a lot of us use humor as this giant metaphorical blanket to shelter us from reality that maybe deep, 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 deep down, Aaron Burr did feel regret. And either way, it's a heartbreaking thought that you're confronting this. And so Lynn and Will Miranda decided to take Voltaire and Stern out of this equation and just leave that quote that is the title of this song, The World Was Wide Enough. It's an interesting, heartbreaking scene. Now, we've mentioned that the seconds in this duel for Hamilton and Burr have a joint statement that they presented for what happened in the duel, but they also have separate statements that disagree with each other. Pendleton, Hamilton's second, would say that Burr shot first. It's an old Star Wars argument right. with Han Solo. There are t-shirts now <laughs> with this line on it. Right. And that he used proof of Hamilton's conversation in the boat with the doctor saying, be careful with these pistols because I haven't shot yet. So my bullet's still in there to say that Hamilton didn't mean to shoot when he actually did. Cause later he would go and find the branch that was shot by Hamilton. And he would use that as proof to say Hamilton thought he didn't shoot. So he must've accidentally shot as he was falling. Right. It was just an involuntary spasm as the bullet entered his side and lodged itself in his spine. He just accidentally pulled the trigger and that's why it was so far off. So Pendleton does say that as his argument saying that obviously Burr shot first and Hamilton accidentally fired. And then a couple days later, Van Ness publishes his statement as the friend of Aaron Burr saying, I respectfully disagree with Mr. Pendleton because I am 100% convinced that Hamilton shot first. And then after a few seconds, Aaron Burr shot after the smoke cleared from the gun, which interestingly enough, William P. Van Ness, by saying that Burr shot a few seconds later, paints Burr as more of a villain because he waits for the shot to clear knows for a fact that Hamilton had thrown his shot four feet away and then takes a clear shot at Hamilton. Right. We don't know that he necessarily knew that he intended to throw a shot away. Maybe he thought that he just missed it. But interestingly enough, Chernow points out that when Burr is an older gentleman in his 70s, I believe, he returns to Weehawken, New Jersey and visits this site again as an old man talking to a younger man. And he says... Hey, by the way, I remember the bullet whistling through those tree branches right up there before I shot Hamilton. And he collaborated with the fact that he knew Hamilton's shot had gone four feet out of the line of sight. And it's interesting that Burr realized how far off Hamilton's shot was, even according to his friend's account. And so we don't know exactly who shot first, but either account really doesn't do a good thing for Aaron Burr's character. I really like how Van Ness opens out his statement there, trying to say, hey guys, I know you're going to be upset at me for saying that Hamilton was the one who shot first here. He was an honorable guy. Don't be mad at me, Federalists. Yeah, uh, that's exactly the line I wrote in the margin of my <laughs> book when I said he opens with a statement and it's like he's trying not to make everyone mad because he understands that he's taking the unpopular opinion of trying to argue in favor of Aaron Burr's position. He doesn't do a good job of it, but perhaps in a future episode, we will go through and have the opportunity to read these accounts to you. We've hinted about what we're doing after the curtain closes on our musical, what we're doing in our future episodes. One of the things we're doing, in addition to a lot of really exciting, fun things, is every month or two, we're going to have an episode devoted to Hamilton in his own words where we dive into a letter he wrote or a document written by someone in his life. And we're going to dive into things like the Federalist Papers and the letters between him and Burr and the letters that his seconds wrote about him. And we're going to go into them and read those for you and unpack them in a little bit more depth on a future episode. Vinton, why don't you tell our listeners about some of the other things we have coming up in the next few months? Because I am excited. So one of the other things that we've hinted at, and we are definitely doing, is reviewing other musicals specifically that are related to this performance. Starting out, we're going to be going over 1776. Right. 1776 is a musical based on the main character, President John Adams. And so we're going to go into that. It has a lot of overlap with our musical. I think it's going to be interesting. And there are ways you can listen to this online really simply. So I hope you listen along and enjoy our analysis of it when we get into it. One of the other musicals we're going to be reviewing in the next couple months is In the Heights, Lin-Manuel Miranda's first 
Broadway musical, which is an absolute hit, an absolute joy. And so we hope you enjoy these musical review episodes as they come up. It's going to be super exciting. One of the other things that we're going to do, and we've also hinted at, is continuing on the story. What happens after Hamilton's death? Where does the country go and where do the people that were involved in the story go? The first of those that we want to actually dive into is Burr and where his life goes from here. Yeah, the conspiracy and treason trials that Aaron Burr has is going to be a fun little episode. There are so many fascinating things that happen in Burr's story because he did survive this duel we've been talking about. And this isn't the end of his story, even though it was the end of his political rise to power. One of the other things we want to do is short 10 minute histories on people and events that are somehow connected to our history here in the musical. We have a bunch of different ideas for what to do with those. Right. We're going to look at people like Andrew Jackson, who is a notorious dueler, who's one of his secretaries of the state was actually one of Hamilton's sons. So there's some interesting overlap there. We're going to look at Napoleon and some of his overlap and uh, maybe John Edwards, one of Aaron Burr's grandfathers. So there's some great things to stay in tune for there. And then One of the final things we will do, in addition to all of these fun things, is we're also going to do some book and documentary reviews for you, going into the resources that we've found absolutely helpful in this particular research. And we're going to dive into, first, the book by David McCullough, 1776, which is going to be a fun story for us to read together and dive into together. And we're going to review it for you, give you some insights to what we've learned from it, what we think you might get out of it if you read it. So I hope you'll join the book club that we start to go through those books. So we're going to start cycling through some of those episodes after we close the curtain on who lives, who dies, who tells your story. And we're going to go into all of those things. We're also going to have a in-between episode before we start all of those, talking about what comes next for the original cast, because we've already hinted at a few things that some of them are doing. We'd like to give you some opportunities to go find what else they're doing. Where are they going to be actively involved in the future? Because these guys have done incredible work, but they have more work ahead of them. So those are our definite plans. We do have other ideas floating around, trying to decide on what we're going to do even further past that point. And as always, we are open to your suggestions. So please get in contact with us. If there's anything you would like to hear us cover or discuss, you can email us, contact at Graphocast, leave comments on the website, graphocast.com, G-R-A-P-H-O-C-A-S-T. Hit us up on Twitter, at Graphocast, or personally, I'm at Flesh Either. And I'm at Alpha Knight. And don't forget, we do have that Patreon exclusive episode coming up very, very soon. So if you have other questions you want to send to us, send us an email at contact at graphocast.com and let us know what you want to know about us. Ask us personal questions, historical questions, things you're interested in, and start giving us a dollar a month or more, depending on what you're interested in doing to contribute to Graphomania Podcast Network. And you can be a part of getting what this exclusive content will be. And that's patreon.com slash graphocast. Next week, I'm going to tell you what I wish I'd known. When you were young and dreamed of glory, you have no control. Next week, we're talking about the last song and there's no stopping it. (laughs) Don't try to stop it. I won't try to stop it. (laughs) I want that to happen. We're here at the end. My goodness. How have we made it this far? I don't know. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next week. Who lives? Who dies? Who tells your story? This has been a Graphomania production. If you would like to hear more podcasts, go to graphocast.com, G-R-A-P-H-O-C-A-S-T dot com. Follow us on Twitter at Graphocast and like the Graphomania page on Facebook for news and updates.